Welcome to episode 16 of CarmelCast. We're in season three this time, and again this week we're talking about St. Therese, finishing up what we talked about last time with her, uh, especially her childhood, and a little bit about her family as well. Um, but before we do that, I have a question for both of you to introduce the episode. Uh, what is your favorite chapter of Story of the Soul? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> oh, the the numbered chapters. Let's see. <laughs> I would say this is terrible, but whatever chapter is manuscript B, I believe it's chapter seven. Right no, no, it's, it's later than that. Is it? Yeah, it starts on. That's chapter nine. Chapter nine. Yeah, but yeah. definitely chapter nine. Then I would and say. And why? Wow. <laughs> I'm all about you know, going for shortcuts and, uh, and not, you know, trying just, just to get everything at once. And that, that chapter kind of, she sums up her little way, the history behind it, um, what she felt like her call was in the church, you know, her discovery of her vocation to be love, like all those things are kind of packed into that one chapter. And so I find it very helpful as a review, especially to like get back into Therese and reading that can be very helpful. Cool. So that'd be your recommendation for someone. If you if you only had to read one chapter of Star of Soul, we wouldn't recommend that, of course. Yeah, no, no. But <laughs> as a quick review. Don't chapter, be like me. Chapter 9 is great. Chapter 9 is great. All yeah, right. I'd say so. Thank you for answering first. That way I had time to think, think about what I wanted to say. <laughs> I, I think I would probably say chapter 1. Um, mm. I think it's chapter 1 anyways. But I mean, that's when they talk about our early childhood. I love reading about the saints when they're like toddlers. Mm. I just think that... I don't know. It's so inspiring to me to see how, um, yeah, there's their, their little personalities and how they come out in different ways. And, uh, I think it just r- relates to all of our lives. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably what I would pick. It's, it's kind of what really made me, uh, more than anything, uh, appreciate Therese. Yeah. yeah. I will answer two and I'll, I'll, I'll pick two chapters, one in your vein, uh, the chapter where she goes to Rome, yeah. which is chapter... Five. Five, which we're going to talk about next week, I believe. Um, but I like that chapter because you really get a sense of her personality. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's just there's a lot of funny things that happen when she's on pilgrimage in Rome. Yeah. Um, so I always, I, I love reading that chapter. And then more in your vein, yeah. uh, the chapter where she makes her profession. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, and that's chapter eight. Mm-hmm. Um, and because that's where she makes the offering of herself uh yeah, the, the famous offering to merciful love. Oh, yes. um, that's the point in her life where she makes that. So I really, it's the last chapter of Manuscript Day. Um, and it's one of my favorite prayers that Therese wrote. Yeah. So that could be a whole season unpacking yeah. that prayer. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, definitely. Cool. So uh, why don't we just, you know, quickly introduce ourselves once again. Uh, if you watched this last week, you probably know, everyone probably knows who we are. But um, I'm Brother Pier Giorgio, Christ the King, um, this Chaos Carmelite. <laughs> um, approaching my solemn vows in a few months so please pray for me in that regard yes. and i'll be ordained a deacon pray that I, hopefully you know if god yeah. wills it <laughs> yeah so uh, brother uh, father <laughs> sure brother father yeah yeah i'm both, I'm both. uh <laughs> father michael joseph of saint therese and <clears throat> discuss carmelite um i've been in now just actually approaching well three and a half years almost four years since i really entered carmel the initial formation so it's been a great grace and i'm brother john mary of jesus crucified and i'm also a student uh, studying at our house of studies in oregon mm-hmm. and all of us uh, in a way represent ics publications the institute of carmelite studies um, for more information about that we direct you to our website icspublications.org and right now we have a uh, lent sale going on where all of the works of saint therese are on sale um, as well as uh, books about St. Therese. So we direct you there to, to learn a little bit more and to get to know St. Therese a little bit better. Yeah. So, awesome. so Father, you're, you're in charge this week. Oh, so my goodness. I'll give it, hand it over to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big, big topic here that uh, I, this too could be a whole season, um, but it's about the family of St. Therese. You know? mm-hmm. and, and as we know, the saints don't just come out of nowhere. And just how formative Teresa's family was. We talked a good amount about that last last episode, but I think now just going into a little bit about each one of her, you know, the people closest to her, mm. um, 
and just a little about their life and then maybe to seeing how that that could have shaped her um so and i think again it's it's fascinating just because we can all relate to these members of the family you know and and in a way they could all be canonized probably but they all had many struggles like we do they all kind of lived there is a normal family life and it's just helpful to see again that like she didn't just come out of nowhere um so i guess to start maybe the the you know the patriarch as they called him the great patriarch uh lewis and his full name is lewis joseph aloysius stanislaus martin so this is a, a solid name um and and very invocative of, of his faith you know but um but i don't know maybe just talk a little bit about him first and we talked about zelly last time for a good a good amount but uh maybe now you know how how did lewis what was his kind of story and how did he have have such an influence on on Therese? So, well, we're in French right now, so we have to say Louis. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got to change a few of these then. Too. <laughs> Louis Martin. Louis Martin. <laughs> We've been practicing our French, <laughs> yeah. and you dropped the ball. Oh huh? my goodness! First one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess for me, um, you know, Saint Louis Martin, uh, he had such a deep love for his family. Uh, and along with that, you know, great trials with giving each of his daughters uh, over to, to Carmel, um, with the exception of, you know, Celine entered after after his death, um, but each of them, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And, Le and Leone eventually would be visitation. But... Right, but uh, Leone was kind of in and out of, of, I mean, she was entering religious life around the same time that Marie was. Yes. So and we'll then get, actually, yeah, we'll get into yeah. all that. <laughs> That's a complicated story. Too. Yeah, we have all sorts of. We have to get into each of them. So we'll talk about how they came to be um, religious. But this whole aspect of of Louis's life and um, of giving his daughters to God uh, in in the religious life, I think, is an is an important aspect of of who he was. And um, and with each one, I'm sure it, it got more, you know, harder and harder. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think Therese was probably the hardest for him. Uh, but he also recognized very, you know, clearly that Therese had a vocation and his willingness to, uh, to, really uh, let God, um, let God's will be done in in the life of of all of his children. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I I just love the um, the affection between Therese and her father. Um, she would often call him the the king of Navarre, and and uh, she was his queen. Um, so there's this really just beautiful relationship there, and you can see how that shaped her relationship of God as well, which I think is true in all of our lives, um, whether for good or for ill. Often, father figures in our lives, whether they be our biological fathers or uh, other relatives or priests, even. Uh, the way that we interact and see them, especially when we're younger, can affect very much how we see God. Mm -hmm. um, and so Therese then had this example in her father of uh, a very loving and compassionate man. Um, I remember there's a scene where I think she's, it's when she's sharing her vocation with her father. Uh, he's outside sitting by a well, just like contemplating the beauty, you know, of nature or whatever. And Therese goes out there and sits down near him and right away you can just tell how like in tune he is because he notices that she's upset like that something is up he sees like her eyes watering and so he pulls her over and he puts her head on his chest and like holds her like that and asks her like what's wrong my queen my little queen uh and then she she, she starts talking with him but it's just a beautiful that uh, yeah you can see how therese really embraced that image of a loving, compassionate father and a merciful father and how that really uh, helps her to see God in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes I think too that he was such a good father that it would have almost been hard for the daughters to have found <laughs> a husband, you know, that would match someone like that, you mm -hmm. know. And, and so it made sense in a way that they all entered religious life because he was such a great example. And as a, you know, as a holy man, contemplative, very prayerful, I, I was always struck where Therese would say in Story of a Soul that I knew, I knew how the saints prayed because I saw my father pray. Mm -hmm. and, and how much that strikes, you know, a, a child when they see the father on their knees praying, yeah. um, what that does for a child, you know, and just to not underestimate that. Um, and so, yeah, so this, this closeness that they had, um, 
you know, and, and in a sense too, it's not like she never had any struggles, you know, it's not like it solved everything for her life. Um, but it was such a rock for her and what a father can be, you know, and that, and, um, and he was very contemplative. He's also a man's man. He liked to fish, liked to go outside. He loved pilgrimages, you know, and he would, he, he did a, like a couple months with a priest to like Greece and various places. I think he might've made it to the Holy Land. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so he, he loved the kind of the traveling, you know, so he, he, sometimes you get this impression of him as just kind of this older guy that's just stayed in the house all the time. Mm-hmm. That really wasn't, wasn't him either. Um, you can see a lot about his, pers- you know, his his character and personality by his p- choice of profession as well yeah. as a as a watch watchmaker and mm-hmm. uh, in repairman, uh, the intricacy that it would have taken to to work with that sort of do that sort of work, uh, it, it sort of demonstrates how he was very uh, more uh, introverted and uh, and also very focused uh, mm-hmm. in order to do that work. So th- I can only imagine. Um, you know, in my work as an editor and a translator, it's kind of the same way. It's very detailed oriented, but it's also allows for a very you know deep calm and, and uh, opportunity for for prayer and contemplation within. Yeah. Uh, you don't get as anxious and worked up when you're working on watches as opposed to maybe being uh, a cattle rancher or something like that. So yeah. it's kind of an interesting aspect of him and his his career choice, even. Yes. Yes. We can see how his uh, that contemplative nature and kind of like his his holiness, his uh, union with God, um, affected too. Well, like you were mentioning earlier, his as his daughters were going off and leaving Carmel, um, because it's not like because he was so united to God's will that he didn't struggle through mm-hmm. that. Like it was a, a very big struggle for him to see his daughters going to Carmel to hand them over in that way. I think that's really good for us to see that example of it's still a struggle, like even if, even for the saints, yeah. this, these natural affections are so strong and so beautiful, um, that, but it was a sacrifice that he was willing to make. Mm. Um, and he was, I, I remember that he was kind of, uh, he was well respected and talked about because it's like, oh, here's the man who gave up his, you know, four of his daughters mm-hmm. to go to Carmel. Like he was known for that sense, for that willingness to sacrifice for, for God. Yeah. It's kind of interesting too, because, um, well, just thinking he, he, he really sacrificed everything for thing for them at the beginning too, because he had a whole social network in Alençon where they lived before Zelly died. Um, and you know, he had his friends, he had his Catholic group, you know, he had all these different things going on, but for the sake of the girls, he brought them to Lisieux where he knew almost no one and did it for the girls because he knew they needed that in their life, you know. Mm-hmm. So he sacrificed himself for them. And then you think his whole life then is for them. And then each one goes off and he sacrifices each of them. And I think right after Therese left, he actually paid 10,000 francs for an altar in, in Lisieux um, that's still there. It's the high altar that he sponsored all himself. And, and they said that was kind of his final sacrifice in a way mm-hmm. he... He put himself on that altar, you know, and, and after he gave all his daughters and then pretty soon after he, he got his sickness, you know. Yeah. Um, so it really was, yeah, that was this aspect of just a total gift of self, you know, in his family. Um, but maybe that, just to go on then to say, do you, could you speak a little bit about his sickness, you know, and what that kind of meant for them? Well, at this point, uh, the only daughter who's, who's back, maybe Leonie is back for a time during this period, but she's kind of in and out of the, of the ho- household uh, during this period. But uh, Therese's, you know, next oldest sister from her, uh, Celine, really, you know, in sort of the natural progression of things, you know, Celine considered that she had a vocation to Carmel as well. Um, but in order for Therese to really enter, you know, to, to fulfill her dream of entering and, and the, to fulfill the process that she'd been going uh, through since she was 14, um, of trying to, to enter Carmel, she really sacrificed uh, her own, you know, entry into Carmel in sort of the natural progression of time in order to uh, to assist her father, who at, at this point is uh, dealing with um, dementia and, um, and, and sort of a memory loss associated uh, mental illness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, very trying on, on all of the daughters, um, and to, to see when they saw their father and how much he aged, uh, it seems like he aged very quickly. 
Uh, if you if you see the photos of over the course of of ten years um, of of St. Louis, is it's just uh, remarkable, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, what an effect the illness had on his health, yeah. his physical health and well being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there was also, I think, a lot of suffering for the whole family at that time because of the stigma that went along with mm. with the mental illness that he was suffering from at the time. Because um, at first, I think it was like little bouts of forgetfulness or he would like, I think there was a time where he just like disappeared for several days and no yeah. one really knew where he was, mm-hmm. um, which is so unlike him. Um, but it was, yeah, this, this whole stigma around mental illness as if like... Um, yeah, it, it wasn't quite understood as we understand it at, at this time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that led to a lot of suffering, I think, for the family as a whole. Yes. Yeah, and there was a lot of sort of talking behind the family's back with regard to, to what was going on, you know, associated with that stigma. You know, people sort of jeering about, you know, how how his youngest daughter entering Carmel sort of made him go crazy or something mm-hmm. to that effect yeah. um, and how hard that must have been for Therese to to you know to reject that sort of understanding of 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 you know the reasons why and and what effect her entry into Carmel had on her father yeah definitely and it was a suffering for him too in the sense that he would go through phases of being in and out so even when he was in a, a psychiatric facility living there there were times where he'd have more lucidity and um it seems that those times would be very difficult for him because that's when he'd be most aware of being away from his family and the whole stigma of what he was suffering at the time. Mm-hmm. But he was still able, like, I remember reading that a lot of the, the it was sisters who took care of them there at this facility, they were just, like, amazed, very edified by him, yeah. uh, by the way he just handled the whole situation so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had a real sense of resignation to what he was going through, and he kind of, there's some sense, too, that he maybe knew what God was asking him and he accepted it, you know, as, as part of his own journey. Um, and, and then, you know, he was able to come, I think the last time he came was when Therese was clothed as a novice and, and, um, and in their last encounter, you know, he, he of course was out of it in a lot of ways, but he was still, he still had a really active faith. And, and I guess he, he pointed up and basically said like, we'll meet in heaven, you know, to in heaven we'll meet. And then, so he just, he always kind of had um, his bearings with him in a sense, you know, deep, deep down at least, and, and that living faith in the midst of whatever, you know, the disease did to him. And, and um, so it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it, I think it's helpful to keep in mind a lot of people have relatives in these situations, you know, or um, you think of fathers or mothers that get um, Alzheimer's or dementia, and it seems like they change so much, but you know, deep down, that faith, hope, and charity is still hmm. still burning. Um, but, um, well, maybe, and we can move on. You know, there's, there's so much about Louis <laughs> that we could say. Um, but uh, we'll go into the next oldest daughter, than the, or the oldest, um, Marie-Louise Josephine Martin, <laughs> <laughs> um, who is known as just Marie, right? Yeah. She's always Marie. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about her and, what, what her role was in the family. So Marie was the, the second, she was the oldest daughter, but she actually entered Carmel after Pauline, mm-hmm. uh, which gets confusing at times. Um, but uh, she was also Teresa's godmother, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, she, she speaks of, uh, of, uh, of Marie as, as uh, her mother as well, in, mm-hmm. that, in that spiritual sense, in that uh, you know, spiritual paternity that is associated with our baptism. Um, so I, in that sense, you know, another sort of mother figure for, for Marie, uh, for, for Therese, uh, Marie was, um, and, and followed her sister Pauline to, to Carmel. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I know more about Pauline than I do Marie. And I think that's, that's the case for a lot of people. Yep. She's, she's kind of the, one of the more uh, forgotten, uh, sisters, but, yeah. but certainly one who uh, was important for Therese in yes. her life. Oh, definitely. And she really, like you said, she was really, um, at, at certain times, a, a great mother figure for Therese. She was 13 years older than Therese, um, but she was teaching her uh, catechism classes oh, and yeah. things like that. So uh, we do see it. Yeah, she was, because she was so much older, I think it's hard. I can't relate to having a sibling 13 years older, yeah. but it really, they become almost a parental figure in our lives, I think. Mm, definitely. And Therese kind of used her as a confessor, too. You know, Marie, Marie had this... Uh, Great sense. She was. She had a nickname when she was a little child. It was I am quite free because the the 
maid would try to make her do things that weren't like necessary in a sense. It wasn't obedient, but Marie and the other kids obeyed. And like, Marie's just like, no, I'm not doing that. Cause <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they had this nickname. She was always like that. She didn't like conformism. She didn't like formalities, you know, and, um, and she had this, just a, a very realistic sense, I guess, and kind of transcended some of her age in a way. And so, um, so it was actually the biggest shock when she entered Carmel because no one would have expected Marie to enter Carmel. Um, and so she, who was so, uh, in a sense, valued her freedom so much. It's interesting because she said, when I entered Carmel, I, that's where I found the greatest freedom, you know? And, and so Therese, I think, benefited from that freedom a lot, you know, and, and as a, when, when she had her struggle with scrupulosity, she would kind of confess to Marie first. And then Marie would say, nope, don't worry about that or that or that. Just tell the priest this. Yeah. And, um, and that helped her as a lot to form her conscience and not be so, yeah, kind of enslaved to her, mm. whatever she was going through at that time. And I think we hear a lot about Marie, um, you know, after Therese died, because she was so influential in, in the process of, of Therese's canonization. So that's really where we, we kind of see uh, more about, about uh, you know, Marie's own account of, and in the notebooks as well, from, uh, from the time when Therese was dying. Uh, we begin to see more of her relationship with Therese. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, it's kind of interesting in that sense. And she was, I mean, she lived, to, I think, you know, she was the oldest, but I think she also lived the longest of all the siblings. Um, she, yeah, she died earlier, but she, I think she lived, yeah, I think she got to just about 90, mm -hmm. I want to say. So I she think. really would have experienced, you know, the whole, you know, breadth of, of Therese, well, all of her sisters would have experienced yeah. in the entirety of Therese's life, but this aspect of, of seeing something come to completion in, in her, in her canonization. Yeah. Especially this little baby she remembered, <laughs> you know, you think yeah. it's, it's kind of amazing, but, um, well, definitely now I think maybe to go on, you know, to, to Pauline, the next, the next older, she was 11 years older than Therese. Um, and, and as you said, probably we know more about her, but let me just say a little bit about her role and kind of her character. Yeah, she was also um, a great mother figure for, for Therese. We mentioned this on the last episode about mm -hmm. how after their mother passed away, Therese kind of looked to Pauline as, as her mother yeah. and how hard it was for Therese when Pauline entered Carmel. Mm -hmm. and, and Pauline was, uh, had took over kind of a leadership position within the Carmel um, in, in a sense as well. I mean, this is Mother Agnes. I mean, maybe it'd be helpful, you know, as we go through this to, to also give their religious names. So, oh, yeah. Because Marie stayed Marie. Yeah, Marie the Sacred Heart. And, uh, and Pauline, her name in Carmel was Agnes mm -hmm. of, do you remember her title? Of Jesus. Agnes of Jesus. Yeah. So, um, you know, Paul, uh, the whole, the most of, uh, a great majority of Story of the Soul was written um, by Therese to Pauline as Mother Agnes as her superior, uh, and that's why you'll see in different in you know, different places in Story of the Soul, um, you know, Therese referred to Pauline as you know twice her mother, yeah. as both uh, prioress and the sort of adopted mother, mother figure that uh, Therese had in her in her life as a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it seems that um, even her role as as mother prioress, you know, like you said, she wrote it to Therese, but then when when she, when Mother uh, Marie de Gonzague became the prioress again, and, and Pauline, her mother Agnes, uh, was became sub prioress, still because of that connection and that authority that she had, um, she was given permission to be with Therese during her last illness for mm -hmm. so much of that time. And so, all of like the, the gems we have in the last conversation are fruit of their relationship, you know, and, and they're, they're going back and forth in her last illness. So, mm -hmm. We can really be yeah grateful to Pauline for um, I mean just so much of Therese's formation and then her writings and things kind of came so much through her. Um, and what a grace you know that we had that you know Pauline was uh, prioress of of Lisieux at the time when she asked Therese to begin writing story of soul yeah. because. Uh, if, if it weren't for her that we wouldn't have had we wouldn't have anything yeah, exactly. <laughs> that we, you know we wouldn't you know have this great testimony this testament of, of Teresa's life and, and the way in which God worked in her so we owe a lot to Pauline yeah no I for sure and I think even even uh, just to know too it's not like their relationship was always super smooth you know there were misunderstandings between them even in Carmel um, 
there was a certain point uh, Therese made this whole play for Pauline's feast day. <laughs> and at the whatever, Mother Agnes was in a bad mood or, or just it was going too long or something, but she didn't even let Therese finish the play. She said, okay, that's enough, you know. <laughs> and poor Therese went off and just shed a tear or two, but then really kept herself together. Um, so it, they had this beautiful relationship, you know, in, in this mother-daughter, but but also, you know, there were just the normal human kind of things in there too, and it's good to keep that in mind, you yeah. know. It was this ideal thing. Um, to give a... We can talk about this again next week too when we talk yeah. about Therese's entry into, into Carmel, but uh, one of my favorite sort of vignettes between... Uh, between Pauline and, and Louis, her father, is when uh, Pauline sort of orchestrates this delay of for Therese entering Carmel and Louis comes into the speak room and starts wagging his finger at her. <laughs> yeah. so, he was very disappointed and upset with her. And I kind of, I mean, of, of the all the siblings, you know, Pauline had the most... Uh, I mean, she was she was uh, you know commanded her own her own will in a way, um, and and uh, Louis you know would, would complain about that at times <laughs> because because she sometimes she wasn't uh, com- always you know uh, she wasn't always known for keeping her promises yes, in a yes. sense and and uh, Louis understood how much that affected Therese. Mm-hmm. Now moving on through the siblings, we get to to Leonie, uh, Marie Leonie. Martin, um, and what what could we say about her? What was her role in the family, and maybe how she affected Therese? She was most remembered for this, this her struggles, I think, mm. um, which I think at the time she was almost she was almost she wasn't talked about a lot and kind of forgotten. But I think now we see her rising more um, because she's one that we can all relate to in our own struggles. I mean, she really struggled with illness and. Uh, she had some kind of some disabilities and just great stubbornness. She seemed just um, psychologically not as stable mm-hmm. as the rest of the children. Mm-hmm. And I think Zelie, of all her children, was most worried about about uh, yes. about Leonie and and how she would you know succeed after you know knowing yeah. you know uh, Zelie knowing that she was she had cancer and she was uh, terminal. She worried a lot about about uh, Leonie, mm-hmm. not just then but earlier too. She what would she said? I think she said, well, what will become of this child? Yeah. Um, so, and Leone, you know, to her credit overcame and, you know, through God's grace, of course, overcame a lot of that, um, in terms of really, uh, finding her, her stride in life, uh, mm-hmm. in religious life, uh, first with, um, well, eventually she ended up with the visitines, the mm-hmm. visitation, uh, nuns, um, and and was kind of in and out of that uh, several times. It took her a while to really get settled, and to really you know find her stride in religious life. So that was, you know, that would have been a very a difficult struggle for her. But uh, you know, through grace, God's grace, and, and really accepting her vocation, um, you know, third time's the charm, right? Yeah. She she really succeeded and and lived her whole life uh, in the visitation. Yeah. Uh, the, the spirituality of the visitation for those who don't know is. Uh, this is uh, Saint Margaret Mary, mm-hmm. and and the devotion to the Sacred Heart is very, very central uh, to to the Visitation Order. Uh, so, um, a very and very contemplative order as well. So even though uh, Leone didn't enter Carmel, she did enter a contemplative order. Yeah, uh, one that's, that has a very rich tradition. Yeah, and it was it's, it was kind of the natural option for really all the sisters because um, because uh, Zelie's sister was a Visitine nun and they went to school there you know and Leone actually went to school there and couldn't stay because her behavior was so bad right and it's like um so it just shows you know like what she had to overcome compared to the other sisters who were kind of model students in a lot of ways and was were expected that if one was going to be a sister they would end up entering that convent you know whereas Carmel you know called but Leone always had that deep desire to be a nun you know and um, and she started with the poor Claire's right and left after just a couple months, then went to the Visitines, left, went back, left. <laughs> and then as she said, the third time after Teresa's death, even, you know, um, that she entered and then just what a model of perseverance. And she became such a, a model for the other sisters too, of just this humility. There was a story after Teresa was, you know, I think it was even after she was canonized, um, People were very interested in her family, and, and one of this one bishop had heard about her sister in the Visitine convent, and went to visit 
you know, to see what she was all about. So she, he gets there and the portress opens the door and he, he asks, you know, can I see um, Le, Sister Leone, who changed her name to Francois Therese? And um, the sister said, um, it's really not worth it. You know, like you, you won't probably get what you th you're thinking. You know, it's not, it, it's, you know, she's really nothing special, you know, and you probably won't really appreciate the visit. And the bishop was kind of discouraged by hearing that and was surprised by the lack of charity. And his sister had left kind of dejected. And he called later and the mother prioress told him, oh, that was Leone. <laughs> so, um, so she had a, a, you know, a deep humility and, and, um, and a realistic sense of her own struggles. And the other sisters, the novices loved her apparently as this when she was an older sister and really looked to her as a model. And when she died... Um, people would start coming to her tomb, you know, her little grave site, and miracles started happening, which opened up something that ended up taking off and becoming the process for her canonization, you know, and so she's now officially a servant of God, and people are writing letters all the time of these favors obtained through Leone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's such a beautiful example of, you know, having these struggles, but then persevering and God using it to make you a saint, you know. I think an important aspect about her life also is the fact that she suffered abuse at the hand of uh, of you know someone trusted in the family yeah. uh, and the person of the maid. Uh, so for someone to overcome that situation in childhood, I mean that those sort of instances, especially for children, are incredibly affect affect in uh, in children uh, you know a profound impact. Yeah. So to to really see how she overcame. Uh, the abuse in, in in her later in life in order to to persevere in religious life and, and holiness. Yeah, definitely. And it, and it gives reason to why she did have some of these behavioral struggles and, you know, why things weren't as like, you know, with the other sisters maybe didn't have some of this that she did. And, and you can see, you know, there's reasons behind it. And thankfully, Zelly found out, you know, right before she died and was able to get rid of the maid, more or less. And, uh, and, and it really opened up that relationship so yeah like God's providence working through that mm -hmm. definitely um, yeah so we still have a, <laughs> so, now we'll go quickly the, the next siblings who passed you know was um, Helen uh, Joseph Louis and Joseph Jean Baptiste um, Helen was five years old when she died and um, it was very hard for the family of course especially because they knew her, you know, I mean, she had her little personality and was, um, you know, a playmate with the sisters. So how difficult that was for them. Um, but of course, the other ones, too, even though they were younger, um, those were the two sons, you know, and apparently one of them, uh, Zelly said he had the hands of a missionary, you know, and, and so like, so she she saw like, and was even thinking, I think, started making like a lace because she did lace making for a future alb, maybe, <laughs> if he would become he a was, priest. He was less than six months old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, brothers have intuition. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but, um, but when they passed, you know, and I don't know if maybe if you want to say anything about that. We talked a little bit about that last episode, but um, maybe just the effect on Therese that these little ones had. Did you say? Because Therese didn't know them, right? She mm -hmm. never met any of them. Yeah. But, but she, she would, yeah, she had an understanding. You know, she knew about them obviously, and and had an understanding of them as sort of her brothers, her little brothers in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, as that was a, a sense, she knew that they were interceding for her, mm -hmm. and that gave her a lot of comfort as well. Yeah, yeah, she always referred to them as her angels in heaven, so she knew that they were still a part, an important part of her family, yeah. mm -hmm. and that in some ways she was still very close to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's cool too. It just shows how how much um, the family with the living and deceased are all one, you know, and um, that there's no reason to forget that or yeah, kind of put that to the side. That she saw them as her siblings, and I think she attributed to her healing of scruples too to them. She mm -hmm. went to them in her need once Marie left Carmel, you know, and she, they really came through for her. Um, but then the next one after them would be. Uh, Celine, right? Uh, very famous. Um, what can we say about about Celine? Well, of all the the sisters besides Therese, she's the she wrote the most. Mm -hmm. uh, Sister Genevieve was her name in Carmel of the Holy Face, mm -hmm. and uh, is that right? The Holy Face is that her title? Yes. Okay, I always yes. get the titles mixed up, but yeah, um, 
Sister Genevieve wrote uh, books about bo- her parents, mm-hmm. uh, both of her parents, and that was one of the earliest uh, instances that we knew, uh, besides the, the parents' letters that they wrote themselves, um, but, but Celine's uh, recalling of her parents, and also wrote a book, uh, a, a testimony of, about her relationship with Therese. Mm-hmm. Um, and another, another uh, sister who has books written about her as well, um, of all of, uh, Celine would, I think, admit this herself, but of all of her sisters, she was the one who, who really uh, struggled the most with Therese's sort of message as a, as a contemplative and as a saint. Um, something that really she had to wrestle with in terms of that idea of, of giving yourself entirely uh, to, to God's mercy. Um, you know, she had that, uh, like all you know, people at that time had suffered from scruples and scrupulosity. Um, and I think it w- would have been interesting for her as well because she uh, would have been a novice under Therese. Uh, Therese would have, was in practice the novice mistress, but in, I think in, uh, officially she was the assistant novice mistress. But uh, for all you know, practical purposes, you know, Therese really formed her, mm-hmm. her younger sister forming her in religious life. I think that uh, would have probably been difficult, right, yeah. uh, for someone <laughs> to have their, their younger sister kind of bossing them around yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, under obedience too. So it's uh, in that sense, but uh, in childhood, they were very close as well. So um, yeah, just that, I think that's an important aspect of, of, of Celine and, and her role uh, in the promulgation of both Therese's message and, and her relationship with Therese uh, and how Therese would have, would have seen her and interacted with her. Yeah. yeah. I, I absolutely love Celine. She's, <laughs> yes, I was gonna say, she's yeah. my favorite. Um, <laughs> I relate to her and, and her struggle with Therese's message too. Um, Celine was very, uh, naturally gifted, just like very, had a lot of, she was strong willed, mm-hmm. uh, very courageous and, um, she had a lot of natural gifts, but I think because of those natural gifts, she struggled then with the message of Therese, which mm-hmm. is this little way of learning kind of to, yeah, just rely completely on, on God for everything and not rely on yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and like Pierre Giorgio said, the times of when she was under uh, Therese and the novitiate, like Therese was kind of teaching her this way, but she struggled with it. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's a, a, she's a beautiful example for us of, of, uh, yeah, some of us, I think Therese's message just resonates very strongly with us and others struggle with it. And yet Celine really became the first and kind of the best disciple of the little way yeah. and showed the power that it has in someone's life mm-hmm. to transform them. Yeah, and I, I love the the anecdote too that it came after Therese died. You know, Therese worked with her so much. And of course, you know, she was influenced very much by Therese during her life. But like you said, that kind of tension was there a little bit and um, and just her personality was so different that that uh, even up to the point of her death, she didn't quite understand the little way. But then a few months after, it like all hit her this one moment and she became the greatest promoter, you know, and um, in during the processes, apparently, too, they had when when they interview the people, you know, for the process, um, she was talking about this new way of Therese, this new little way. And the the um, postulator said, listen, if you start talking about this new way, this is the greatest way to shut down this canonization process. And so let's just kind of focus on Therese and not worry so much about this thing. And Celine, in her all of her boldness, said, no way. She said, this is the only reason I want Therese canonized is so that we the, the world can know about the little way. And so she didn't hold back, you know. And, and so she, yeah, like you said, she became the kind of greatest promoter, advocate of the little way, even though that's what she struggled with the most during Therese's life. So. Yeah. And it's because of Celine that we have all of the incredible photographs yeah. from the Carmel, uh, because Celine was, like you said, very gifted and artistic. But as a photographer, uh, she she had permission to to take photos of, of life in Carmel. So we have those those wonderful images of Therese. Yeah. Uh, you know the moment that she passed, even. Mm-hmm. So uh, we can thank her for those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for this. For this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Our giant our giant photograph of, of Therese. Yeah. So, yeah. Doesn't everyone have this? <laughs> um, well, I think then this would be a good good moment to to move on to um, kind of the next part of Teresa's life, right? You know, she had all this influence from her family, you know, all these things shaping her life until she got to a point where she kind of had to come into her own. Mm-hmm. And and what do you know? How 
where do we see that, I guess? Where is that moment or that, that kind of part of her life where, where she finally blossoms? Well, I think, I mean, the, I think if you asked Therese what was the pinnacle moment of your life or, or the, the, the fulcrum of, of, the, of, of when you know, you received, she received her vocation, uh, she would attest it to, to what she calls the Christmas miracle because it was, she, so she knew even from the time that she received first communion that she was hypersensitive and, and this would be kind of the, her greatest struggle uh, in, in overcoming an imperfection her hypersensitivity and she knew that she wouldn't be able to overcome it without God's grace. Uh, and it took, you know, she struggled with it for, for, for several years, even after, you know, recognizing that this was her greatest fault. Um, but that grace uh, to the grace to, to overcome and to, and to heal through that hypersensitivity uh, came to her in a moment uh, and, and at Christmas on Christmas Eve night uh, when she was 14, I think. And uh, this Christmas miracle, she received the grace to, to really sort of reject that hypersensitivity in her, to choose to, to ignore it, to choose to, to, to grow up in a sense. Um, and it's really at this point where she, she feels like, okay, now I can enter Carmel because uh, in a sense, she's, she knew that she wouldn't be able to be a Carmelite with this hypersensitivity. She wouldn't last a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it, been. it was a very you know, pinnacle moment in her life, uh, th this Christmas miracle that she, she writes about in, uh, in chapter five, I think, or chapter six, maybe. Mm -hmm. Let's we're... The very end of chapter. No, it's the very beginning. beginning it's the very chapter. beginning of chapter five. Yeah, five. Yeah, chapter six is the trip to Rome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was a, a very and then you know it, it really sort of inaugurated the her whole um, discernment as a religious, and I think we're going to talk more about that next week. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I well, let's go ahead and read the account. Want to read it? Yeah. yeah, let's let's hear it. I think it'll be good to hear Teresa's own words about this. Yes. She writes, <clears throat> I was really unbearable because of my extreme touchiness. I cried like a Magdalene. And then when I began to cheer up, I'd begin to cry again for having cried. God would have to work a little miracle to make me grow up in an instant. And this miracle he performed on that unforgettable, unforgettable Christmas day. It was December 25th, 1886, that I received the grace of leaving my childhood in a word, the grace of my complete conversion. We had come back from midnight mass where I had the happiness of receiving the strong and powerful God. Upon arriving at Les Buissonnets, I used to love to take my shoes from the chimney corner and examine the presents in them. This old custom had given us so much joy in our youth that Celine wanted to continue treating me as a baby because I was the youngest in the family. However, Jesus desired to show me that I was to give up the defects of my childhood, and so he withdrew its innocent pleasures. He permitted Papa, tired out after midnight mass, to experience annoyance when seeing my shoes at the fireplace, and that he speak those words which pierced my heart. Well, fortunately, this will be the last year. I was going upstairs at the time to remove my hat, and Celine, knowing how sensitive I was, and seeing the tears already glistening in my eyes, wanted to cry too, for she loved me very much and understood my grief. She said, Oh, Therese, don't go downstairs. It would cause you too much grief to look at your slippers right now. But Therese was no longer the same. Jesus had changed her heart. Forcing back my tears, I descended the stairs rapidly, controlling the poundings of my heart. I took my slippers and placed them in front of Papa and withdrew all the objects joyfully. Having regained his own cheerfulness, Papa was laughing. Celine believed it was all a dream. Fortunately, it was a sweet reality. Therese had discovered once again the strength of soul which she had lost at the age of four and a half and she was to preserve it forever. The work I had been unable to do in 10 years was done by Jesus in one instant, contenting himself with my goodwill, which was never lacking. Yeah, so I think it's a perfect place to, to maybe wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think next week we'll, we'll talk more about 
the effects of this and what and you know where this led her yeah. uh, this profound sort of moment in her life where she was she was able to overcome uh, that sensitivity and and that and begin to flourish in life so uh, join us next week as we uh, talk about that and uh, yeah we'll have a wonderful blessed uh, first and second week of Lent <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes thank you thanks guys God bless you God bless Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalced Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.